Hello and good evening. I am so, so grateful to be joined by Dan Howell, author of this extraordinary book, You Will Get Through This Night. What a title. I know. It's a bit provocative, isn't it? I wanted yeah. something that could inspire people. I feel like it's a bit aggressive almost, but maybe that's a good thing if you're trying to force people to confront their issues. Yeah, know. yeah. And also, I, uh, there are times when I need to be told that, you know, in, oh, in, yeah. in a simple declarative sentence. <laughs> You will get through this night. It's a beautiful title. It's such a wonderful book, Dan. Congratulations on it. I, I've been living with this book for, for a week now, and it has already had a really significant impact on my life, even though, um, you know, I've, I've struggled with my mental health for a very long time. I have had a, quite a lot of therapy. I have read quite a few books on this topic, and I don't think <laughs> I have ever... Yeah, I'm sure. I don't think I have ever read anything that is as empathetic and yet at the same time, very narrowly focused on helping. I, I throughout this reading experience, I felt like, uh, I felt like the person writing it uh, cared about me and also that w was, was genuinely interested in trying to help me, not just trying to help me understand what I'm going through, but trying to help me understand how, how I can bring about change in my life. Well, thank you. That really means a lot. And, it, you know, it's a struggle for me to believe anything nice that anyone says. But I know, I, I, trust, I know. I trust you, John. You know, you've been manipulating my emotions for a long time now. So uh, <laughs> when you say that, that, that really resonates with me. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, this is... It's a funny situation right now, me and you talking, because it's something that we don't usually get to do that often. And whether it's in some theater in some random country or in the back of a video convention somewhere. I'm glad that despite the apocalyptic circumstances that we're having this. So just thank you for joining me. I really it's, appreciate it. It's always great to talk with you. Um, I, I agree that too often it's in public and, and it's not often enough in private, but I'm, I, I'm such a huge fan of, of you and your work. And, and in this book, especially, I feel like you've, um, you've achieved something very, very special. And, and that really is a, a, a big departure for you. I wonder if we can begin by talking about the introduction to the book and, mm. and, and where your story of this book began. When did you start thinking, I think I'd like to write a book about mental health? For me, this is the book that I wish I could have read in the past. I think that something that I've learned about myself is that I really just create the things that I'm interested in. If I'm joking about something, it's something that I find funny. If it's a story I want to get off my chest, I'm probably being self-indulgent. I want people to hear it. When it comes to talking about sexuality or mental health, and especially from what I've had with YouTube, which is realizing the impact that anyone can have on other people in their lives by sharing their story, by breaking down these walls, or for someone with loads of followers, how they can change these hearts and minds. I thought, what is the book that I wish I could have had in my hands that ticked those boxes of just telling me the things that I wanted to know, making it entertaining so I kind of can get through the homework of thinking about these things, but making it relatable so that I don't feel that kind of secret shame about my mental health struggles by feeling like I'm weird. So I thought, hey, if this is my brand at this point, after 10 years of being an entertainer, opening up my wounds, you know, monetizing my trauma for other people's entertainment, let's just put it all on the table. I will use myself as an example of every single possible thing that you could think <laughs> of in, in relation to your mental health so that you don't feel as weird. And for me, it was, you know, I, I don't want to write a memoir uh, because, Firstly, my entire life story is just on YouTube. It's been there. You can go watch it. Haven't right. deleted it yet. I probably should. <laughs> no, <laughs> I hope you won't. Also, I hope you won't. Also, I'm 12 years old. I haven't had a life yet. I'm not ready to do that. So for me, it was like, this is what I would want to create. And yeah, I think that's something that really I'd only be in a position to do because of the perspective I have as a creator with an audience who's had that, you know, realizing the impact you can have on other people and me going, what can I do with this power and responsibility? Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I feel like when I'm when I'm making work, I, I'm almost never making it for my current self, but but I mm. am at times making stuff for my past self, especially yeah. when I was writing Turtles all the way down. I never felt like, oh, this is about me or I'm writing about me, but I did feel at times like I was trying to write toward the kid I was who didn't mm. who didn't know who felt a felt a tremendous amount of shame 
you know, over not being, because in my case, I have, I have OCD, I struggle with intrusive thoughts, who had a tremendous amount of shame over not being able to control what he was thinking about and not being able to choose his thoughts and, and feeling completely snowed under by, you know, these, these huge uh, storms of, of intrusive thought. Uh, and, and in this book, I, you know, you, you are really compassionate to your, to your adolescent self in a way that when, when, of course, we are adolescents, we can't be. Uh, you know, and 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 I know that you've, because because you you you've had a, a a younger audience for much of your career. Like there's there's an ability to, I mean, when when you see young young people struggling, you want to be able to give them the perspective that they cannot yet possibly have because they're still in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. That's me. I think people see me as their um, kind of weird old the brother whose yes. life is a mess but occasionally dispenses wisdom so yes. if i can do that then sure i accept that role <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah for me it's like great uncle but same basic gig um, um, i i did see a lot of you in asa though and you know that, yeah. that that's interesting because how how much throughout all of the novels that you've written have you put yourself into your characters versus you know yeah. the, the the mental health aspect of that particular piece it must have just been so personal for you and there must have been quite you know similar to me in the things that I've done sense of you know a cathartic element of you addressing something that you wish you could have dealt with for yourself but also knowing the impact it can have on the readers on a very specific topic that means a lot to you yeah and I think in a way it's a lot easier to um to write about your scars than it is about your wounds to, to use the cliche and and uh, you know I I was able to because I was, I felt like I was writing back to whatever extent I was writing um, about or about or adjacent to my own experience. I was writing back to it. You know, I wasn't writing about my present tense experience as much. Um, and and in this book, I, a lot of it is is you looking back on the really really difficult uh, times that you've had in your life. And one thing I hate the verb to normalize, but one thing I really <laughs> loved about this book was the way that it normalized having having mental health. It it yeah. it, it emphasized uh, it emphasizes the fact that everyone has mental health, and when we only think about mental health in terms of pathology, when we mm -hmm. only think about it in terms of mental illness, and we see um, we see mental health as being uh, static, as being one yep. thing forever. This does a huge disservice to the way that we we, not, we never think about physical health that way. Nobody ever says like, "Oh, I don't have physical health." Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't How's have any. I, I don't have any health right now. <laughs> right. I'm like, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not good or bad. It just doesn't exist. Um, it's the biggest struggle I've had with kind of how to communicate this book. And I've realized the biggest fight I have in just getting people to accept it is all of my friends and family. They feel the same way. They're like, "If I'm not cripplingly depressed, I don't need to be interested in my mental health." Right. And then I ask them. But are you too stressed? Do you spend too much time worrying? How well mm -hmm. do you sleep? Or just what are even your relationship with your own ability to handle emotions and interact with other people? Because all of this is mental health. And it's almost like a light bulb moment where the first time you even consider that and then go, I'm going to stop and reflect on how I feel and why I feel that way. It's a question that 99% of humans go through their entire life without stopping to consider. You might be like, oh, I'm bleeding. I noticed that. Whereas people can go, oh, my entire life was so painful in regards to my mental health. And I just wasn't aware that was something to solve. And you know, I wanted this book to really be like, hey, this is for every human with a brain, not just for people that seem as, you know, falling apart as Dan might be. <laughs> but also that like that that it isn't always going to be the same when you're if you're going yeah. through a period of unwellness, that need not be permanent. And if you're mm -hmm. going through mm -hmm. a period of of managing your mental health really well, that also might not be permanent. And understanding, yeah. and, and for me, one of the critical things has been understanding that even when I am in a crisis, that's not permanent. And exactly. And 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 being able to appreciate and acknowledge the way that that these experiences wax and wane is really really central to how this book goes about kind of helping people to manage their mental health. For me, at my lowest moments, it was always rooted 
in this belief that I couldn't escape and that I was stuck in a situation that the way yeah. that things were wouldn't change. I didn't have the power to do it. And even, you know, especially when you're younger, there may be circumstances that prevent you taking, you know, these huge steps to not just dealing with your authenticity or your identity or these massive, huge things, but even just your lifestyle, you may not be able to do things, but what you can't do is be that teenage Dan that thought this is life. I have no power and nothing will ever change. And that is just fundamentally untrue, which is yeah. a very profound thing to realize. Yeah, I mean, there's this there, there's this really wonderful section right toward the beginning of the book. I have a ton of uh, of pages marked, by the way. Not that I, I not that we're, I'm going to like ask you to like go through page by page and um, and then Pop take quiz, my, yeah. just take my compliments. But um, I like that you fold the corners, by the way, because I do that. And a lot yeah. of book people are like, how dare you? And I'm like, well, it's know, a physical yeah. object. Let me desecrate yeah. it however I like. It means yeah. that I'm physically yeah. connected to it. <laughs> also, it's mine. You know, like, yeah, I, exactly. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to like resell it on the first edition market. Like, Get I your own one. Don't fold it. Get yeah, out of my I, business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, books belong to their readers, like not just in terms of interpretation, but also in terms of what I do with the pages. Physically. So it, there's this uh, great moment here where you say it isn't binary about mental health. And and mm -hmm. I, I think that's so important because when, when we talk about mental illness, we often talk in binaries. Um, you, you, you have this condition or you don't. But in fact, yeah. like almost a, a lot, not, not everything certainly, but a lot of this stuff is, is a continuum. Mm -hmm. And understanding it as a continuum also kind of makes it less uh, overwhelming or shameful for me. Like when I think about uh, having, having OCD or, or struggling with depression or, or anxiety as, um, as, as, a, as a continuum instead of as a binary, uh, nice. that, also, that also means that it like doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have to be like all or even most of who I am. I don't mm -hmm. have to define myself uh, primarily in the context of, uh, of this one uh, challenge that I have. And uh, freeing yourself from this, this binary way of thinking about mental health, it's good or it's bad, uh, is uh, I, I, I think one of the great gifts that this book has given me. It was a realization that I didn't have for the majority of my entire life so far. And it's mind blowing just to think that something so simple and yet obvious can com almost completely change your perspective of reality, if not your moment to moment experience yeah. of being alive and someone who thinks. And I just had this misconception that, and this was, you know, even after I spoke about my journey with depression and on YouTube in 2017, when I first talked about that, that was almost the beginning of my journey to really understand what is mental health and why do I think this way? It was that I am built a certain way and therefore this is just what my life is like. When in reality, humans as these biological machines and how our brains work, we think there's such a disconnect between I'm in control of what I'm thinking there's all this biological stuff and therefore it's my fault for all of these thoughts. When you realize how intertwined our automatic biological, you know, the way that we get stress and anxiety, it comes from yeah. what we experience physically, uh, our sleep, our diet, the amount of movement that we get in the day, all of these things that are just so subconscious have such an, not just, sometimes it's an immediate effect. Cause I know that you've spoken about hating exercise, going for a jog and then feeling calmer. It's literally, it's almost a relief that humans are a lot less mysterious and magical than we thought. And that actually you can yeah. just do a couple of physical things and you have the power, but then it's also a bit daunting because you realize, oh no, if I have the power, I have to try now, <laughs> which as right. a procrastinator, yes. Yes. that's the hard pill yes. I don't want to swallow. It's like, oh, well, I can have some control over how I feel. Damn, I don't get to be self-indulgent now. <laughs> yeah, and also understanding that like, and, and this was a this was a real this was a process for me of understanding. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize here that you 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 are something of an expert. I am nothing of an expert. Um, and the the book, and we'll talk about this a little later. But but the mm -hmm. but the book uh, was deeply informed and 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 vetted by a proper expert, an actual and, expert. <laughs> and that is and that is that is super important. But but my my experience has been that I think when I when I start what. what you know, like a lot of people, I first sought mental health uh, help after amid a crisis, amid a very serious crisis. Yep. Yep. And, and, and because of that, I kind of saw the tools of cognitive behavioral therapy and even the tool of medication as a way of 
ending the crisis or yeah, minimizing the crisis. Uh, mm. but, but what I didn't understand is that the, the lessons of cognitive behavioral therapy, the, the strategies of it for me can be, can provide an ongoing support level so that if I, yep. if I use them, I, it, it always helps. It helps when I'm well, it helps when I'm not well, it helps when I'm in the middle, it, wherever I am on the continuum, it, it helps. That's the exact thing, because people, they think that mental health has to be something reactive, that you go through periods of, oh no, and then how do I fix it? When in reality, it's something that you need to understand. If you're in a good place and you think this conversation doesn't apply to you, and you just like John's book and you like my jumper, you absolutely <laughs> have to know everything in this book so that you understand why you are in a good place, how to keep yeah. yourself there, and then what to do when you get to the other side, because it is that wave that goes up and down. And for some people, they think, you know, I'm broken, I need to pick myself up. For some people go, this doesn't apply to me at all, and I'm fine. But actually, you need to understand just how the choices that we all make every single day affect how we feel, and to be aware of how you're treating yourself. Because I think a lot of our default programming as humans is inherently uh, pessimistic. It's very defensive, because we're wired to fend off predators and to yeah. view everything as a threat. But that is really just not the best way to operate in the modern world where we need a bit of perspective on our own minds. We need a bit right. of reflection on how we're talking to ourselves, And sometimes you need to ask a friend, what do you think about me? Because I can say personally, my own voice is not very honest. And uh, whilst it's served me good as a survival mechanism, it's not very good at keeping me content in the long run. <laughs> so that's, that's my homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, that's such a huge thing. And, and that's, I, I think for a lot of, a lot of young people, especially, mm -hmm. it's hard because you, the, the very tools that I used to make it through high school, yeah, uh, and to make it through middle school, which were very, very, very difficult times for me. But the tools I used to survive the the difficulties, the the the, the trauma that I went through, mm -hmm. those tools were really good at helping me survive, and they 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 worked. Like they got me out of that, and I made it. Um, that 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 kind of trained my brain to think like these are great tools, which they they weren't. <laughs> this is life. Yeah, I should go into every situation expecting physical danger. No, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I I do want to ask you about the the expert that you worked with um, on mm. this book and the ways that the ways that she contributed to it and 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 the importance of um, of having that uh, having that input so that um, you know you you could you could have everything vetted in the book. I mean, I think it's safe to say humanity has a bit of an issue with facts generally yes. yeah. <laughs> at the moment. It seems to be a bit of a thing these days. We all, we all love yeah. our WhatsApp conspiracy theories and not believing in experts. And for me, at first I was like, oh, I want to do this book. This seems like a great idea. And then there was the angle of so many times you just see something with some great graphic design on Instagram and you think, I'm going to take that advice. But it's so dangerous to think that way. And particularly when it comes to mental health, I just had to make absolutely sure that this was watertight. And I didn't want to write a book that was about my opinions about how mm -hmm. I'd like the world to mm -hmm. work or even just because, uh, you know, spirituality does a lot of amazing things for people and their mental health. But I just wanted this to be like, here's a book of pro tips, facts, and evidence-based approaches that have shown, if you wanna make yourself feel better, this is something that's been proved to work. So I had an amazing clinical psychologist called Dr. Heather Bolton thoroughly fact check the entire thing, which often involved deleting dozens of pages at a time. When I felt I'd done a good job, I'd be like, hey, right, right. this is my whole thing on depression. And she'd just go through with a red highlighter and be like, yeah, this is a problematic area. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> and it's just little things like, when you're talking about something, you shouldn't use that kind of language because even right. though you think you're being right, actually this is problematic somehow, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. this is what somebody thought was good advice, but actually that's not what people are saying in 2021. Yeah. And what that meant was, even though this took months of planning and back and forth and iterating to get to a point where we were like, yeah, this is done. Now I can hold it and be like, I, I trust this. You know, I right. can follow this advice. If it if it wasn't in the book, then you know it, it's on the cutting room floor for a reason. So it was difficult, but yeah. necessary. Yeah, I mean that's a, it's such a weird thing. It, like the, uh, the the position that um, that you ended up in, where you yeah. are a, a, a hugely trusted voice for a lot of people, mm. but there, you know, so often just just to 
speak transparently, so often I feel like uh, people want that, they want that uh, position, but they don't mm -hmm. want the really, the, the responsibility that comes with it, which is- Terrifying responsibility, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and especially when you're writing about mental health, especially when you're writing about, um, you know, writing potentially to people um, who are, are fragile or who are yeah. going through really rough patches, you, mm -hmm. you do need to be very careful. And that was, I mean, I certainly learned that writing Turtles All the Way Down and having experts read that. And there were places where, you know, I like, I was, I, you know, I, I was like, oh, I know, I know all about this because this is I've, my perspective I've, on the issue. Yeah, 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 I've had, I've had OCD for like, you know, 40 years. I'm, I'm pretty good <laughs> at having I'm it. An expert, yeah. um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you want to, you, you need to take that responsibility seriously. One one needs to take that responsibility seriously. And you know, I, I one thing I really admire about both the work that you and and the work that that Phil does is that mm -hmm. you do you do take it seriously. Um, you don't see it as something uh, to uh, as an opportunity. You see it as a responsibility. Yeah, I mean, I have that level of fear which is a good thing you know in life we have all of these fear induced filters uh for me there's the whole i have this quite cynical mindset where i always expect the worst feedback from all people which comes mm -hmm. from my teenage thing of nobody likes me i'm terrible and everything's a disaster therefore when i create anything i assume that everyone's going to hate it so by the time it goes through this coffee straining filter it's just a bunch of diamonds left i'm in the corner crying but it's achieved something <laughs> good so you know that's my thing but what this has meant here is i'm like oh i take this you know it, it very seriously and especially when you realize how impactful it can be to some people and, and you know this is the whole how i got to the point of talking about mental health was i'd go on these tours i'd go to conventions i'd be at vidcon and even when i was just you know working in light entertainment people would say that one funny thing you did really meant a lot to me and it brought a smile to my face at this worst moment people would say you know i watched your videos with my sister when she was in hospital and for me it's just how do i even compute that information yeah but not only does that motivate me existentially it gives me some kind of hope that at the very least everything that you do accidentally sows some goodness into the world whether you intend it or not and i definitely need every little shred of hope <laughs> that i can yeah. get so yeah yeah that's another thing that i really ad admire about this book it, it's so easy to write books uh, to, especially when you're writing about mental health that are like um hopeful but bs that are like hopeful <laughs> but like the hope doesn't really stand up to scrutiny it's yeah. like uh, you know, this this will end, and on the other side, there will be the sweet silver song of a lark or whatever. Yes. And and, and instead, presenting it as no circumstance is permanent, including mm. good circumstances. You know, like that that no circumstance is permanent, and and understanding that, and understanding that, as as you say beautifully at the end of the book, that life life is long. I mean, it, life is long if you're lucky, and 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 and. Preparing yourself to have a good long life is, it's a great strategy. Yeah, it seems like a pretty essential, th that, that's why when, when I started the process of reading this book, I was just screaming. <laughs> It's not taught in schools and some, you know, I don't know what the, the difference is with the British curriculum, but it's just something that 90% of the material in this was news to me. And I just wonder how I'm functioning as a human day to day without even being aware of how I think or feel or operate. And everyone has a responsibility just to get these things in their head and then have it there. But yeah. I wanted this book to be like a lean, mean mental health machine in the, I, it's quite svelte at 300 pages, I think. There's a lot of stuff that was on the cutting room floor. If I was going on about a, a story from my life and it didn't make a point, if it ever tipped the scale from being like, I am using myself as an example for you to relate to, so maybe you feel less ashamed, like it had to go, because then it's just taking up too much time. If we started getting too tertiary about any of the topics, and it wasn't really just the information that was helping people, it had to go. Because I want this to be something that's on a shelf and you can come back to it when you need mm -hmm. to remember how mm -hmm. to do something. So yeah. I would love to write a 1300 page book all about me and my top 10 high school embarrassing stories, but that's not the goal here. You know, I want this to be the thing that someone folds every single corner on and then they go, right, I'm gonna try this thing out today. What was that thing again? So for me as a creator, 
it was quite a difficult experience to drop my own ego and keep it to the, you know, what people need. <laughs> I'm not writing this for myself or even right. just for the followers that have been with me. I want it to be a call to action on a bus stop for some guy that's having a really bad day and then they get something out of it. Yeah, hopefully. no, for sure. Um, I, on that front, actually, I think I, I thought it would be cool to go through and list some of the um, some of the tools or uh, or strategies that that you really responded to, and maybe I could share a couple that I really responded yeah. to. I'll go first to give you a second to think <laughs> about the answer. So the first thing that um, where I was like, oh, and I'm yeah. sure that I I, I I'm sure, I know you didn't invent this, but I I didn't know about it mm. is the anxiety equation which I did not know about. <laughs> yeah. um, and I don't like equations. I was very bad at math. In, oh, good, in, really, in same. Oh, Thank you. That makes me feel better. Epically bad. Like, <laughs> so bad, so bad that I, I yeah, real bad. Um, so the anxiety equation is that you, the level of anxiety you feel about an outcome is equal to the likelihood that it will occur times how awful it would be if it occurred, mm -hmm. divided by your ability to cope with that outcome if it occurred <laughs> plus the 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 people in your life or the, the support, ways you have yeah. of being supported and that like immediately clarified for me <laughs> oh like the things that i'm terrified about and that i really the thing actually the the things i struggle with uh in terms of obsessive thought spirals mm. are exactly the things where that equation is very high can break so, it down yeah and so like that number ends up being very large and so now i have this very <laughs> built-in way of decreasing the number which is yep. focusing on my coping and my rescue and if mm -hmm. i can focus on that then the total number of the total size of the anxiety about the outcome will go down because i have focused on the my, my strategies for coping with that should it happen and uh, focused on the support that I have in my life, uh, should it happen. And that is just so clear and simple. And I, I have been trying to understand that <laughs> since I was three years old. I know, it's, I, I am too an obsessive thought spiraler, just into oblivion. I'm the, I, I still to this day, and I'm taking the own advice from my book daily, bolt awake with anxiety about something unspecified at 4 a.m. with this feeling of cosmic terror and then my heart's yeah. beating and I don't know why and I've just been a complete prisoner of this physical response for so long without the ability to just break it down and then once you again it's that light switch thing when you start thinking about your thoughts and just acknowledging whoa, whoa, whoa I'm going to stop being obsessed with the physical experience of this mental problem but take a step back and then go okay firstly hi I'm feeling this secondly Am I, why am I feeling this way? And then how can I either solve the problem or at least manage my own, you know, functioning of my, my mind and my body to make it better? It felt like an escape rope had literally just been chucked down this hole <laughs> when I had just been swirling around in this maelstrom flailing going, oh, mental health is so mysterious. Why do I feel terrible? Guess it's just the weird ghosts in my head. Turns out, no doesn't have to be that mysterious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so what's a, what's a strategy or, or a tool from the book that you find yourself using? Uh, for me, it's definitely just being in touch with the physical world. I'm someone that by default lives up in my head. Mm -hmm. I am just a thinker and an analyzer, and I'm very rarely, the reason why I'm so good at being an introverted nerd that has no life and never goes outside is I can sit in an armchair with a laptop and feel like that's my universe. I don't feel like the world is small. People go, Dan, don't you just want to see uh, like a flower or travel the world? And I feel like, no, I actually, for some reason, feel quite content just with the internet and my own imagination. But the problem yeah. is the the your brain is just not supposed to spend that much time upstairs. <laughs> it's meant to react to the light, lightning bolts, right. and saber tooth predators chasing after you. And I sometimes will just sit and I imagine myself just zoning out. And then suddenly I'll snap and I'll go, oh, right, I exist. I have arms. I'm sitting. Yeah. I can think and I can feel. And for me, just being aware that I have sensory input, I'm like, oh, look, the, the color, look, green, green, green. There we go. 90% of my anxiety will just wash away. And it's a constant reminder every waking moment to just 
indulge in my senses, to look at the world around me and to just try to be more present in particular, because I'm only ever permanently um, living in the past, worrying about something that I did 10 years ago or feeling immensely stressed about something coming up in the future. And I just do not live moment to moment, even in my long-term planning, you know, when I, when I go to therapy and they're like, how happy do you feel in your life? My problem is that I only ever live for the fantasy future I want for myself in five years time and do not enjoy a single day in my day-to-day -day life. Cause I almost tell myself I don't deserve to. It's like, well, you know, I may be in my apartment and I've got this pizza, but pff, you know, I'm more concerned about what I need to do in two years time. And actually right. that's, you know, if I, if I don't stop doing that one day, I will just die of old age and I never actually lived. So that's something that I have to probably tattoo on the inside of my eyelids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I ever have, want it to stick. I mean, I have very much the same issue. Like my therapist always jokes that I'm, I, I constantly say like, I mean, in a couple months when I'm through this, uh, things will be great. And she's yeah. always like, I'm gonna no. turn my life around. No, in a week. couple months when you're through this, you'll be talking about how in a couple months when you're through that, like, it, uh -huh. it, you know, like there is, you know, you you do. And that's one of the, I, there's a, there's a uh, tool in the book, the five, four, three, two, one tool that I thought was really interesting. Such an obvious and, way of breaking it down, yeah. Yeah, and I did it I did it myself actually, like in the moment as I was reading the book, which is where you engage each of your senses in turn by paying mm. attention to uh, what you can what you can look at, trying to pay attention to the texture of it, and then paying attention to what you can hear and paying mm -hmm. attention to what you can touch, paying attention to what you can smell, and then at mm. last uh, paying attention to, uh, to to just the taste of of the world around you at that moment. Mm -hmm. And 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 the whole issue with thinking problems for me is that um, I'm not in my senses at all like i'm not even in i'm not i'm not in i'm not in where I, i'm not in the place that i'm in and i'm not i'm not smelling the stuff that i'm smelling i'm 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 10 years ago and i'm three years from now and i'm <laughs> yeah. i you know i'm I, i'm i'm all these other places and and so really like i found that that's actually one of the ones that i was going to cite i found I, I i find that very helpful i've been doing a version of that with um that I learned in therapy for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I do find it very helpful. Even when I'm like having a panic attack, I had a, uh, I, I, I had a panic attack recently in, a, in an uncomfortable space. Well, there's a great part here where, where you talk about panic attacks and how like the, one of the real miseries of panic attacks is if you have them in public, like it's just kind of hard to be like. Compounding on every single thing about it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it happened in Target, and I just like I had to sit sit down on the in the fucking oh sorry for cursing in the soap aisle of Target, and yeah. uh, and uh, just sit down for a couple minutes um, and put my head between my knees and do the stuff that I got to do, and it was fair, yeah. and I was embarrassed, but I was also like, you know what, like that's this is one of <laughs> this happens. is one of the pleasures of being forty three years old is I was able to I I, I was at last <laughs> okay. able to be like you know what this is happening and like if yeah don't mind me guys me, I'm having a panic attack next yeah. to the bread yeah 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 Life. It's not, <laughs> I know it's not ideal for you but you know who else is not ideal for me yeah. uh, nobody wants to be here <laughs> no, nobody wants to be a target in a pandemic on a Tuesday um, mm -hmm. but uh, but I I I I still was able to find that strategy of I am here, these are the sensory, the ways I'm engaging um, sensorily in this space as, mm -hmm. um, as a way of grounding myself. And I, I loved in this, I, this is a phrase I had never heard about um, in this book. I, I, I know I've been doing it, but I didn't have a word for it, forest, yeah. forest bathing. Oh yeah, was it Shirinyoku? God, the Japanese, yeah. well, basically every culture that isn't British or American, has these beautiful phrases for all of these yeah. wonderful philosophies and just te techniques and appreciating the world. And it's that yeah. thing where it says absolutely everything about indulging in your senses and tapping into probably the state of existing in the real, you know, biological evolutionary world that we have been created for that just naturally soothes us. Yeah. And it's one of those light bulbs that you go, oh, well, that never really, I didn't really appreciate that before. And then I realized how sitting in a sterilized environment with a blue light in my face probably isn't what I was built for. <laughs> yeah, but like being in the forest, I, 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 again, I never had this phrase before, but being in the forest is like taking a warm a bath. bath for me. Like it is calming. Mm. It makes me feel like I am, it, it reminds me that I'm actually not separate from the natural world. Like we, we are yeah. so conditioned to see 
the the natural world as somehow uh, separate from us. Like there's the yeah. world that we create, and then there's the so-called natural world. That and that, around. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of like uh, misses the fact that we are made out of earth. <laughs> you know, like Literally. we, like, like uh, there's no part of me that isn't earth, <laughs> including the clothes I'm wearing, but also like mm -hmm. my body is made out of earth. And so when I am in nature, when I'm, I, I mean, I shouldn't even say in nature because everything is in nature, but when I'm walking outside, <laughs> yeah. when I'm, when I'm walking in a forest, I do feel that sense of like, ah, and it, it really is super gave me helpful. A full existential crisis when I was writing that part. Cause I ended up going on this whole thing that was like, why is this so profound? Why is it so true? Why does it say so much about who we are and what we came from and how we're built? And then I was like, but wh why is our heart beating and we don't control it? How is our consciousness and what we think we are intelligent on any level, just yeah. different from these completely automated things? And when you start to realize actually your very specific anxiety about this very weird specific 21st century human problem is just something biological. It is terrifying and immensely freeing at the same time, which I think is a sweet spot. At least it'll yeah. slap you out of the situation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is weird. Consciousness is very weird. Like it's a it's a weird situation to be in. It's weird yeah. that it's weird that we have thoughts and feelings, but we're made mm. out of meat. It's the whole mm. thing is is very weird, and it is it is super helpful. Like one of the things in in this book that I I kept coming back to was it is helpful to remember the situations that we evolved for and how. Um, how poorly suited the world we find ourselves in is yeah. for the brains we have. I mean, social media is just the complete information overload. I find myself increasingly, I think when I was younger, I was, it was just so exciting. I just used to immerse myself in it for 29 hours a day. And then nowadays I'm like, whoa, actually seeing a 24 hour news cycle, seeing all this social media forcing us to compare ourselves to the highlight reels of all of our friends and colleagues, just being given this platform and this, you know, this feeling I have to be part of a conversation, we were just not meant to even digest that much information or to yeah. contribute that much back out. And it's no wonder how, you know, I find myself looking at my phone and then exhale deeply and just notice that I've been holding my breath for about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I was looking through Twitter and yeah. it's like, hmm, no, 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 that's not right, is it? <laughs> yeah, I did want to ask you about that because I, I, I feel like you and I are similar in that we are both ex incredibly fortunate to have found a, a, an audience online and, and that yeah. has made so many of our dreams come true. It's allowed us to have work that we love and, mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and how can we not be grateful for that? How can we not... Uh, it, uh, you know, any saying anything else other than I'm grateful feels utterly seems uh, offensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it does seem offensive. But at the same time, I, I am very concerned, and I know you are too. I am, I am very concerned about what the social internet has done to 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 me, um, mm -hmm. and 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 to my ability to to navigate uh, navigate life in in a in a mentally healthy way, and I'm really concerned about what what it has done to, to young people as well. And I I am deeply conflicted about that. Um, I, that is not a question; it's just a statement. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's a whole massive chunk about social media in the, the second part about your lifestyle and managing it, because naturally, whether we like it or not, it's here. It is a huge part of all of our lives. And nobody goes through it thinking about how it affects their mental health. And that is uh, an absolute dystopian cyberpunk nightmare, in my opinion, uh, yeah. that everyone's just living in every single day. And for me, it was a learning experience that came from simply stumbling at every single experience a person can probably have Me too. via yeah. the internet. And then yeah. you're going, oh, I'm so wise now. That was right. really yeah. painful for a decade. Yeah. And it's yeah, just people- I, I, learned, I learned every single lesson the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I didn't believe anybody about Twitter until finally I was like, oh, yeah, no, no, this has made me really now. miserable. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the thing is we, Unfortunately, we do have to accept that it's there. I, I am inextricably tied to this nightmare that I've created for myself and my wonderful career that I'm grateful for. But at the very least, everyone just has to know everything they can about what the power is in their hands and how they control it. Inherently, 
all of these things are very toxic and scary, but you all have certain tools on every platform and just yeah. with the way that you use it yourself to make sure that you're doing it in a healthy way. And I've changed the way that I used to do it. Cause for me, it was all about like, oh, I feel like I have to follow these beautiful celebrities. I have to follow all these politicians on Twitter. I have to just know what people are arguing about today. So I feel like I'm part of the conversation. And now just knowing when to distance myself from that, or sometimes just to, when I choose to pick up a device to give myself content that will inspire me or lift mm -hmm. me up in some way, instead mm -hmm. of just peeking into Pandora's box and seeing what fancy is jumping out at any given right. moment. Yeah. It's an essential life skill in 2021. It is, yeah. I mean, I want I want to be informed, uh, but, but I think what I've had to learn the hard way is that I need to make careful choices about how I'm informed and also what I'm informed about, because like, yep. The the what the news cycles that that may dominate social internet spaces, I mean, in some cases they're really important and critical, and and I I think sometimes in our in our criticism of of these uh, of these spaces we we can lose sight of the fact that they can also be a a, a locus for really meaningful positive change, uh, but but that those long but the long term problems take take long term require long term responses, and so like the the constant daily shifting of what we care about, I think can sometimes obfuscate the, the real long-term structural injustices that need to be addressed over, over time um, mm -hmm. and need to be addressed consistently um, over time. And so, yeah, I, 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 I feel unsettled about it. I liked the way you wrote about it in, in the book a lot because it reminded me that um, I, Although I often feel like I don't have choice around the social internet, I actually do. I actually do have a lot of choice. I just need to be much more intentional about making those choices and not sort of yeah. just going with the default settings of of putting myself at this, in this information flow. Yeah, it's it, it's wild, and I think that you know we we both obviously appreciate some of the politic, um, well, the positive things that have changed both of our lives and careers from social media, uh, you know, from VidCon to our audience and what it's done for ourselves personally. I always see it as it's just um, an extremeness that's happening to human society thanks to the mm -hmm. power of social media. In that simultaneously, you've got all of these terrifying dystopian. You know, there's all this artificial intelligence. There's deep fakes. There's algorithms. There's all this. You know, social media stuff. At the same time, there's community and education and resource finding, right. putting the power in the hands of the people. And inevitably, humanity is just going in this V shape where things are going to get inherently a lot scarier, but then inherently a lot better. And I think as long as people are aware of, despite the forces that are gargantuan against them and seeing what's happening in the future, at least you have the power to control how you participate in the world, which is the very least any of us can do. And that's just what the book encourages. Just be aware of how every single thing that you do makes you feel. The moment you switch that light bulb and you go, I did something, how did that make me feel? What can I learn from that? You have the power to do things that make you feel good. So the whole book is really just encouraging people to do mini science experiments with themselves every single day, instead of just going through life on autopilot and then going, well, that was stressful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed in the book, the, 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 the statement of you did a science that like, yeah. if, if we treat, if we treat our, our, if we understand that our moods and, and our sense of well-being and our overall ability to, to deal with um, uh, with with difficulty, if if we understand that that is partly a product of what we are what we are doing on a daily basis, and that we can make different yeah. we we you know like you can make different choices that that do have an impact. It can be hard. It's not easy, especially at the beginning. It's not easy, but yeah. um, but. But but it can make a big difference, and I think that um, and and not and not just in response to crisis. Although I think it's that's important, yes. and that's one of the things I love about the way that the book is organized. That it, for those who haven't read it, it begin it, it it's sort of in three parts. It begins with this night, um, which is sort of the in the moment that you need to respond to this. How are you going to respond to this? And then it moves on to tomorrow the sort of shorter term things that you can do. And then it moves on um, to the days after that. To the long and, and painful stuff. <laughs> and, and, the, and the long, yeah, the long term stuff that, that we've got to go through in order to manage our mental health better in a long term way. Um, and so I, I, I thought the way the book was organized was really, really uh, just a brilliant, brilliant structural solution to figuring out how to, how to address these kind of different parts of mental health. 
that that was the biggest task for me. I think that the book took about three or four months to write. It took about four to six months just to plan the structure in bullet points because yeah, it was just yeah. like, before I get into it, like for me, writing comes fairly easy. I mean, no, it's a horrible emotional process, but by the time a type happens, I, I'm in the flow. For me, it's about what's the plan. And there were so many versions of this. We were working with everyone at the, the book editing team, just being like, what are we telling people in what order? What's overwhelming? What, how do we go from this foundation of what is mental health? What might you need to know right now? What's the next thing? And then that so that it's a journey and it's just practical. So it's not a book you feel like you read 400 pages about mental health. It's like, no, 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 here's a chapter about this specific topic and I can come back to that. So I hope it's uh, the, the practical thing that everyone feels like they were missing in their life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it certainly has, it certainly has been that for me. Um, understanding the places where I do have uh, more say mm -hmm. in my well-being than maybe I uh, acknowledge on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, like you said, that also means that I've got work and I can't keep, I can't procrastinate, but <laughs> that's the bad news. It also means that there's opportunity, you know, that like, that, yeah. that, that if I'm, if I'm going through a difficult time, it doesn't need to be permanent. And there are things that I can do immediately, but then also things that I can do in sort of a more long-term way. And that has been my experience of, of mental health. Like, yeah, I, I expect that I will have crises in the future. I've had them in the past. Um, and you got to, you have to deal with them. Um, but I also, uh, I also understand that if I, if I do a good job on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, those are less likely to happen. And I am, I am more yeah, likely to be foundation. better. Yeah. On a, on a daily yeah. basis. So, um, I do, by the way, before we go, before we go into our, our, our big finish and I'm so oh, yeah. excited, I don't know, I don't know what it's going to be, but, um, I do want to say that, uh, and this is something that's emphasized in the book over and over again. If you're concerned about your mental health, um, reach out, reach out for help. It's the number one thing. I mean, if I'm, if I'm going to spoil the entire book right now, the only piece of advice, the thing that matters the most is human connection. And I say this as the world's biggest introvert. I don't like people <laughs> I don't like talking. I find Me it very scary. Yeah. I need to have a two week holiday after going to a meeting. It's not great, but it's just that the worst thing is to feel like you are alone and you are stuck in a situation and that there is no escape. The moment you share how you're feeling with someone and you just get it out of your mouth, it doesn't matter if it solves the problem. It doesn't matter if someone has a great piece of advice for you. Just feeling seen in this universe by another person being recognized immediately takes the weight out of whatever you're going through. Someone doesn't have to change your life. They just have to nod and acknowledge that you've heard them. And that's the most profound difference. And, you know, I think that in this, slight apocalypse that we're in right now, which hopefully we're in the tail end of, that's the number one thing that people have to bear in mind is that I was joking. I was, do I was cracking all those Twitter jokes, like Zoom, never going to another meeting ever again. Bye guys. What I would give John to be with you in some dusty theater oh, me right too. now. Me too. I know. <laughs> On the same way, I was like, I'll never travel for work again. But now, like, what I wouldn't give to, to like, shake your hand. Yeah. Uh, I and, mean, the, the idea of really a VidCon. Oh, oh, God, I can't even imagine it now. I yeah. don't know. But yeah, it's so important. And also to, to feel like, uh, for me, it's very important to feel like I have a fellow traveler. I have somebody yes. who, can, who can support me through this. If I need to make an appointment with a therapist who can check in with me to make sure I made that appointment or, or, or who I can tell that I made that appointment and I can, I can get that little surge of, I did that. It wasn't easy for me, but I did it. And, and to have somebody, um, and, and, and so it, I, I just think I, that's the, that's the most important thing, and 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 to remember that like Absolutely. I'm not an expert. Reach out to an expert for help, um, and or and 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 if you don't know where an expert is, then start start with someone you trust. Start with yeah. some start with a friend, and um, and and I I I have experienced how difficult that can be, because the, you know for me it becomes this sort of vicious cycle where I'm not seeing people. Um, I'm, I'm often pretty ashamed of mm -hmm. how I'm doing. I, 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 you know, I'm embarrassed about it. I, I feel like I shouldn't be doing as poorly as I'm doing. I, and then I'm not seeing people and then it becomes harder to see people and I'm not responding to texts, which makes it harder to respond to texts. And I'm not, and, and, and then I, it and then I just, pounds. Yeah. yeah. And I feel myself sort of pulling away, um, from engagement with the world. And, uh, you know, I, I, 
that's happened to me enough now that I can recognize that that's dangerous as it's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. But it is, it, you know, it, it's really important to reach out and connectedness, even for massive introverts like us. I mean, that's one of the great things about running into Dan at a party is that uh, Dan is really the <laughs> only person I want to talk to at a party because I feel like he's the only person who understands mm. how unpleasant the party is. <laughs> let's, you know what, this, this, this is a very good natural segue, actually. Let's, let's talk about the last time we saw each other because that was yeah. quite an iconically oh. uh, bizarre case study. It's a good example of like how strange my life is and how nothing's ever normal or fine. Um, so to anyone that doesn't know, it was at a convention about, was that two years ago? No, time yeah. doesn't exist anymore. 2019, um, I think. There was a throbbing nightclub. Oh, it was so not loud. my natural environment. It was no. so loud and so dark. I was not drunk enough to be in that room. I didn't no. know what time it was. It might have but been also... the only nightclub I've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. I wasn't expecting it. I just walked through a door expecting uh, yeah, to I, I, to I, some I, weird I, nerds. I, and I think I it like, was okay. in the basement of a hotel. So it wasn't a real nightclub, but it definitely felt like one. And... I was in a very strange place in my life at that point because I had extremely imminently just come out as some kind of gay in the most obnoxiously grand, bizarre way that a human can. That isn't a typical experience. You know, it, it wasn't just a moment for me in my personal life. It was a moment in my career, pop culture. Just, it's, you know, I didn't ask for this, but this is the situation that I found myself in. And the thing is, I don't have a very good perspective on the reality of my own life and how interesting it is because I spend so much time mulling over my own story that it doesn't interest me. So when I reared my face in public for the first time since then, a lot of people were looking at me like, Oh yeah. So I was yeah. I was like, why? I mean it's like obviously why? Because I just did something so bizarrely personal and huge and just put it out there for the whole world to see that people are a bit like, How do I walk up to you right now? And I didn't really take the time to acknowledge that for myself because what I'm not good at is taking a moment to say that I've done a good job or I've done a good thing or to allow myself to receive not just positivity and praise but just a human connection that might be healthy because my default is so defensive and when I'm outside in public there's such a wall up where I'm just you know aware I'm so paranoid I'm looking at all the angles that I have a real problem just forming intimate connections. And there I was walking through the darkness. <laughs> and then I just bumped into John. And you gave me this hug. And at the time, I was just surprised. And I, I didn't know how to deal with it. And it was one of those things where in the moment, because I am just awkward, I'm not, in, and this is the thing, I, I routinely ruin moments in my social life by simply <laughs> being strange and not knowing how to react to make it a good moment. I was like, oh, that it was nice to see John. Thank you. And I think it was when I got back to my room later at night, I was like, no, 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 Dan, that is maybe the first person who has tried to interact with you in that genuine way that you should probably be interacted with. And I just wanted to say thank you for, because I, I don't know if you felt like you just walked into me and hugged me and it was a weird moment. And maybe it was a weird moment, but for me, in hindsight, yeah. <laughs> I was just like, that. that is a microcosm of what I need in my life and really being alive and connecting to other people should be. And despite all the circumstances, I just wanted to thank you for just having that moment. And it just showed that John Green, you have a beautiful soul. <laughs> and Thanks. I'm very grateful that you exist. Yeah, my, my memory of that moment was that um, I was so, um, I was really proud of you. I, you know, I've, I, 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 not that we've hung, hung out a lot over the years, but I, I've watched your videos for a long time. I, I feel like I knew you. I, you know, you have this, it, it is this weird parasocial relationship, but I, you know, I saw your videos when, when you were uh, a kid and, and when mm. you were, um, and when you weren't able to, to be your authentic self. And, and, and I, and I knew how hard that must have been. And I, and I, and I was thinking about, it must be very weird to be in this room. I mean, not just because of the pounding bass, but also it must be very weird to be in this room and have made that video and yeah. know that everybody in the room probably saw it and, and that, um, 
yeah, and that people are going to look at you askance. And I just, I, the, 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 the feeling I had was, God, that took guts. And, um, and I, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to say that to you, that I was really uh, uh, proud of you and that I, I, I really count myself very, very lucky to, uh, to be your colleague and, and to have um, to seen your work over the years, to see the seriousness with which you treat your work and the seriousness with which you treat your audience. It's, I mean, within the realm of also being very, very funny, of course. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, that's, that. so that's what I, that's what I was thinking. And I probably didn't either didn't do a good job of um, expressing that verbally because I never do, or else um, I couldn't be heard over the astonishingly loud uh, <laughs> Cardi B song that was playing. I mean, at the it time. wouldn't so have we're... happened any other way. For us, I mean, let, let's be realistic. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what we're... I manifest in life. Yeah. We were having a pretty emotional moment while Cardi B was <laughs> blasting in the background, making a TikToker doing a backflip behind me. I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, it was really, that, it was lovely to see you. And that, that video, I mean, you, you, you've done a nice job as you always do of being self deprecating about that video. Um, and, and I understand the impulse to be self-deprecating about all of your work, but that video made a huge difference in the lives of a lot of people. And I, um, and it took a lot of guts to, it took a lot of guts to make, and, and it, it, it must've been very, very difficult. You write about that in the book really, really beautifully. I, it, it brought a tear to my eye a couple of times. Um, and, 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 and the video was, was, was wonderful. Uh, well, it really was. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Again, you're one of the few people that I would maybe believe <laughs> when I say that, so that really means a lot. And you know, this, this whole thing is, is a very amazing cyclical moment in the universe because I, I, I probably wouldn't have made this a book if you weren't somehow a presence in my life, just, you know, in pop culture, in the weird YouTube space, or even just the interactions that we've had. I think the last time, you know, we did this event for Paper Towns and I was on a stage feeling anxiety about spilling a coffee on Cara Delevingne, perhaps. And then here we are now. <laughs> it's just, it's Life a very bizarre weird, world. Life and, is weird. Know, the idea that we're reunited here, having a chat over the internet, I like this for us. I think, what, what do people do these days? They have boxing matches and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. This, is, this feels maybe, authentically us. I like yeah, it. Maybe, I, I think it's better than if we try to develop a rivalry so that we can sell tickets to our exhibition boxing. We uh, are we are literally releasing a book at the same time, John. It's true. That I, I mean, amazing. yes. Yes. And I have to say, if you order only one book this week, make it, you will get through this <laughs> make night. Make it by the Dan Anthropocene <laughs> Review by Sean Green. <laughs> I will tell you, I have never been more relieved than when I found out apparently we're not in the same category. Cause I was like, I would love to be second to John Green. Oh but yeah. Now I no. don't have to be. I'm, I'm also great relieved. News. <laughs> That's great news for me too. I'm really glad we're not in the same category. Um, we definitely should have talked about publication dates like six months ago. Probably. Yeah, apparently but... Billie Eilish is releasing a photo book. So oh. I, and I, I might get that actually. So we'll see yeah, what happens. Yeah, me but, too. I mean, it's, it's I bet just, that's cool. um, it's wonderful. We're like uh, mothers that have babies at the same time. We should get them together yeah. to give yeah. each other chicken pox, hang out. Yeah. It'll be yeah. really nice. Yeah, just little like they'll grow up like little uh, little twins. <laughs> they'll always be the same age. That's very that's very sweet to but think I like about. As well because your your book is you know it's, it's nonfiction and it's you having observations on life in the universe and people as well. So that's obviously quite different to the the fictionalized way that you do it. And you know how yeah. how how does that feel for you going from the fictional world to something that's more grounded in reality and your life and your observations? For the record, it's very Dan for him to take an <laughs> evening about his book and try to sell my new book, The Anthropocene Reviewed. <laughs> That's very Dan. But um, it was, you know, it was really lovely actually to write nonfiction. It was the first time I've, I've had writing about myself and uh, mm -hmm. trying to write about the way that I look at the world. And, um, and, I, I, and I needed it this, this year, especially. Yeah. I think I needed to try to make some soft places in a hard world. I needed to try to make some, um, I, I, I needed to try to f write my way back to wonder and hope. And, yes. um, and so that's, I, I, I'm, I enjoyed it uh, actually much more. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I'm really grateful uh, for the time that I got to work on that. But to return to the issue of the day, uh, <laughs> You Will Get Through This Night is such a wonderful book. I'm so, so excited for all of y'all to read it and, and and not just to read it, but to have it in your lives in an ongoing way, as I know it'll be a, an ongoing part of my life that I can refer to uh, for years and years to find 
all kinds of help, uh, all kinds of help. And so thank you, Dan, for writing this book, um, for being such a great guy and congratulations on this. It's a really wonderful accomplishment. Thank you. I will try to take at least one fleeting moment to feel the congratulation on the accomplishment. Let's feel I it. Let's... That I wouldn't unless you asked me. <laughs> take a moment. Let's do it. In fact, let's do it right now as we close. Let's take a moment. There we go. Oof, that's enough for me. Okay, back, back, to, back to putting up the wall. Edgy Dan, gotta, gotta do that self-deprecation. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you. I look forward to your book giving me some desperately needed hope for humanity in the world. And here's to another slightly awkward hug in the future sometime. That's something to look forward to. Oh, take care, Dan. Thanks again. Thank you. You too.